So as Gale is bringing more earthworms and microbes into the soil and that soil is coming back alive, what's happening then in the plant from a micronutrient perspective or, or even like, you know, we've talked in the past about how herbicides and glyphosate blocks that shikimate pathway, which is, you know, prohibiting us from getting certain essential amino acids, et cetera. Like what's happening then in the plant that then can be transferred to the human and, and our ability to be vibrant and vital? It's basically a journey of shifting out of a scarcity mentality into an abundance mentality. And so that as we went reductionist on the farm and said you can only have nitrogen or maybe nitrogen phosphorus or maybe nitrogen phosphorus potassium, the plant actually had to just become the plant because every last scrap of nutrient was being immediately utilized in a starving plant, basically. And for that, there was a loss of community. And at the plant level, what community looks like is basically a mycorrhizae. Uh, if you've ever thrown a shovel in, in the soil, it's the spider webby weird stuff in there that is the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae are a weird, weird structure that is not actually a species of, in and of itself. It's actually a co-creation between a root and uh, and the mycelial network of the fungi within the, the soil system. And they co -create create mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae is the way in which sharing happens uh, between the plants. And so when you go to something like a 15, let alone 100 species cover crop, what you're doing, you're creating so much nutrient diversity. You're moving from this, this reductionist approach back to biodiversity. You're now doing nature's code. Nature's code is adaptation, biodiversity. Biodiversity's purpose is to create more ad adaptation quicker. The adaptation is to create more biodiversity. So it's this feedback loop between adaptation and biodiversity. Yeah. When you break that, then scarcity happens. When you reconnect that, abundance happens. And we now know that there's many plants that thrive best in soils that don't have the nutrients that are even that that plant most needs. Instead, they are fed by other species that know that plant needs this. Mm -hmm. And so it's this beautiful giving economy, gifting economy that happens within the plant world. As there's abundance, they immediately start making mycorrhizae, which are basically the highway systems get nutrients down back in and up into the plant, back down into the soil. So it's a two-way traffic happening in that system. And so he has a system that's so resilient now that after seven years of really intense drought, 23 years of pretty significant drought in the Midwest, his farm is booming. He, he, he can hold 180,000 liters per acre is, is a rough estimate of what his soil is now holding that it didn't have 10 years ago. You know, So 180,000 liters of water is sitting in there making those nutrients bioavailable. It's the dance between water and carbon that makes nutrients available. And so he's feeding carbon, he's holding water, he's creating biodiversity, and so he's become the hands of nature itself. And when you become the hands of nature, you get to witness abundance happen. And, and he said something cool, which is, I just want to be out my cover crop and lay down. Yeah. Every farmer, including I would suspect Gail, it was too busy to even think about laying down when they were chemical farming. And so there's something beautiful that happens as the plants become abundant as there, you become part of that abundance and, and the, the gifting economy includes you as the farmer. And if you read, you know, something like, you know, The Call of the Reed Warbler is one of my favorite books in, in this thing. And uh, is an Australian, you know, family losing the farm through chemical agriculture like you're hearing now. And it's this call of a bird that's left in one little pond in the corner of this guy's world that, that wakes him up to his crisis one morning. He's walking across the field and hears the call of this bird. And it, it reconnects him to his deep knowingness. It sparks that, mm -hmm. that epigenetic memory of like, I grew up hearing that bird and I haven't heard it for years. And it was one reed warbler standing on top of a, a reed in the middle of a distant pond. And he realized that in his lifetime, he had seen the disappearance of biodiversity. And that was his beginning journey back into uh, becoming the hands of nature and, and really back into this gifting economy. And what you described is so perfect is that that immediately leads not to the, just the behavior between the plants making mycorrhizae so they can share with the mycelium that can then share with distant plants, 
the farmers themselves are exhibiting the same behaviors. They're making connections and then sharing information. And so what you guys are witnessing at one of your farm events is the exact same thing at a fractal level from, from what's happening in the mycorrhizae. Your farm school your, is creating that mycorrhizal mycelial kind of network of information sharing that has broken down in the other farmers that, who will not share information for the scarcity that they feel. And so the, the mental health crisis that we see is a, an exact symptom or projection of what's happened in the soil. Breakdown of information and sharing at the soil, breakdown of information and sharing at the, at the human level, because ultimately we're just a natural organism that carries ecosystem within us. The more ecosystem you hold, the more intelligence you, you have as a species. We now know that the human colon is the most complex ecosystem on the planet. The human colon in its anatomy holds more biodiversity per cubic centimeter than anything else. Jungles, rainforests, you know, the coral reefs, nothing compares to a human colon. And we're now starting to realize, my God, this is what unleashes intelligence, is when a single neurologic system has access to that much information. Yeah. That's what makes you intelligent. Yeah. And so as you kill a farm, you've also killed the intelligence of the farmer. As you kill the food system of a society, you kill the intelligence of that society. Mm -hmm. And so our extinction that we're now marching into through our own infertility, as the soil goes infertile, so do the humans that would live from that soil. One in three males is currently infertile in all Western countries of the world, in all Western technological countries, as you might think of it. And so we've lost fertility, uh, one in three. We're headed to, to be probably 80% sterile by 2040. And so as we lose our capacity to, to procreate as a species, uh, we are demonstrating that, that very function of biodiversity equals intelligence, equals fertility, equals you know, survival, equal, equals you know, progress. And yet it takes such a short period of time to reverse those decades and generations of separation and scarcity and everything else. And the healing happens so incredibly fast. And ultimately, I think that's what we can walk away from. And your book starts to touch on as you, you go into those last chapters, the healing starts. And once it starts, it snowballs. And, and you go from a, a, a couple of earthworms per 13 shovelfuls to 13 worms per shovelful. And so that's that momentum of, of life is what has occurred here for 4 billion years. Yeah. It is so much force behind life and you cannot destroy it. The exact amount of energy that was here in the 1940s before chemical agriculture is still here on this planet. It's just changed form right now. And right now all of that energy that used to be in our soil is in our hurricanes, it's in our tornadoes, it's in our you know, volcanic material, but the earth holds that energy and its transmutational power of the natural disasters we're seeing is just a displacement of the energy that used to fuel us is now taking taking apart that what we've created or separated ourselves from that nature nature so that that phenomenon is happening and one last thought that i share and then turn it over to you guys for some last thoughts too and maybe even the last phrase from the book if there's one coming to mind but it, it's terrifying to realize that 85 percent of our rainfall is filled with these chemicals 85 of the percent of the air we breathe and then you go to any grocery store in the country and you're, you're buying these chemicals. Organic less than, but not zero because it rained on that organic crop, right? So we've really created a water soluble toxin pool that can't be separated from life itself. And so you start to give up hope as a biologist or as a doctor seeing you know, the maelstrom of, of collapse of human biology and human fertility collapse. You start to really get into crisis at moments. But a study came out recently from uh, Ohio State, I think it was, that did this study, and they were studying the, the biologic impacts specifically around cancer and herbicides, pesticides, and they were trying to tease this out. And they were feeding higher and higher concentrations of herbicides and pesticides to, to rabbits to show this direct correlation. And they had a whole bunch of different groups you know, participating in rabbits in these cages and this lab over there participating in different concentrations. And one of the highest concentration groups that was supposed to be expressing cancer instantly, basically, was, was surviving unbelievably healthy. And they just, it was like this outlier from all the other data. Finally, the study wraps up and none of the rabbits in that damn pool of high herbicide pesticides were dying. 
they went and even during the study and analyzed like, what are we doing? Is there something being done right? Made sure the chemicals were in there. Made the, mm -hmm. Finally, at the end of the study, somebody thought to interview the technicians in the lab as to what was going on. It turned out there was a technician in there that loved rabbits. And before he would feed the rabbits, he would pet each rabbit and tell him how much they, he loved them and how beautiful they are and how sexy they are as rabbits and just how amazing you are. Super sexy rabbits. And there was just like this, this, this energetic imprint on the animal kept them completely immune from the effects of huh. this high chemical substrate. And so as we ask that question is, is it too late? Which is what a lot of, you know, now you're hearing a lot of international whistleblowers like we, we can't stop climate change, we're all gonna go extinct, blah, blah, blah. And I think the answer lies right there, unless we start loving each other, unless we start telling each other how beautiful we are. Because the moment we do, we will become so resilient to this toxic stew we've created that we will survive to play in this new intelligence that will emerge on the planet post-extinction. Extinctions are great for, for ecology. <laughs> it always gets better, it always gets yeah. smarter, it always gets more beautiful. His farm is more beautiful for the stress that it had for all those decades before. Right. He's hitting levels of earthworms higher than the prairie nearby. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's created something more vibrant than nature had imagined before for the stress. Mm -hmm. And so the, the one-two punch there is the stress is good for us. It's going to create something beautiful. And the love and, and the nurture can overcome all the toxicity that we've created to date. And so those are, those are the promise, I think, that we hold right now is that when we talk about a regenerative movement, it's not about low till, no, no spray, and this thing. Like everybody's rushing around trying to create, you know, I think there's 270 new certifications that farmers can get. <laughs> 270 coming down the pike, and, and now there's a Regen Organic certification that you can get from that, that Patagonia and Rodale worked hard on to get out, and that it'll be, it be in service and that consumers will have more information. But we need to remind each other all the time that no certification is gonna heal this land. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be the community of the soil and that soil community. It's gonna be the community that would then share the food out of that, that land mm -hmm. coming back together and doing it. And when we start to love each other, that revolution will be so complete and so instantaneous that all of your Davos scientists can't even comprehend how fast this thing is gonna change. It looks like it's impossible until somebody decides to love something and, and we have the opportunity to participate in that equation. Hey. Thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.